Praise the Lord. Everybody I said, praise the Lord. The Lord bless everyone today in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. We are asking, O oh Lord, you touch every heart and touch every soul and touch every life today in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, you open our eyes of understanding so that everything we ought to know, everything we ought to have, everything we ought to believe, everything we ought to embrace, everything we ought to do, you grant us the grace to have them in Jesus' name. I will pray, Lord, as we come week after week and month after month, Lord, we pray, we'll grow up to be matured people in Christ in Jesus' name. And I pray that none of us will ever remain the same. Your power in every life, your light in every life, your grace in every life, and everything that you have given us, the fulfillment of promises in every life, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Another Amen. God bless every one of you. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're looking at verse 12. For as the body is one, and as many members, and all the members of that one body being many, a one body, so also is Christ. And then he tells us in verse 13, it says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be born or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. In verse 14, For the body is not one member, the body is not one member. What does that mean? If the head is just moving around, no neck, no hands, no feet, that will be weird. Everybody will run away. If the body has head, but there are no hands, and then it's just going about, you won't be able to do everything you ought to do. The body is not one member but many and then he tells us all those many members external ones visible ones internal ones invisible ones all those members of the body they work together they are different one from the other look at verse 15 in verse 15 is telling us now members of the body in verse 15 if the food shall say because i am not the hand i am not of the body he said therefore not of the body there is no superiority there is no inferiority the food is part of the body and then also the hand part of the body look at verse 16 there in verse 16 if the ear shall say because i am not the eye i am not of the body it said therefore not of the body the eye is there and then the ear is also there in verse 17 it says if the whole body were an eye where was the hearing and if the whole body were hearing, why, where were they smelling? It says we have five senses to see, to hear, to smell, to touch, to taste, and then we move about. It says all those members of the body are very important and they're very essential. And it says this is the work of God, is the arrangement of God. Look at verse 18. It says in verse 18, but now, as God said, members, every one of them in the body. It says, don't concentrate only on one. 
and don't nullify don't destroy the ministry of the ear and the eye or the mouth or the feet or the hands or the levers or the kidneys everyone all the parts have their function to play and then when we so much appreciate a single member of the body and then transfer all the functions of all the other areas on just one member of the church even the head the hand says the head is so important i'll not do my duty let the head do that the ear says i am not the head let the head do that and then the mouth says let the head do that if all the members transfer all the responsibilities of all the members of the body if we transfer it to the head we negate the plan of god and the purpose of god and we negate the usefulness of all the members of the church what the lord is saying is we don't direct everything the body has to do to the leader of the church to the pastor of the church or to the GS. if we want to do this head if we want to go here head if we want to handle this head if we want to do anything head it says every member has its function you perform your role i perform my role and it is like that all the members of the body will be useful will be united and then will be profitable in verse 27 it says now ye are the body of christ you the church you the members you the ones who are saved and you are baptized into the body of christ it says ye at the body of christ and members in particular look at verse 28 in verse 28 it says and god has said some and god has said not one some if we understand God and we're moving with God and we're living in God and we center our understanding on what God has said and God has said some in the church first apostles secondarily prophets thirdly teachers after that miracles that means you can work miracles without being an apostle after that miracles that means you can pray a miracle can happen without you being a prophet after that miracles that means you can pray and move the hand that works miracle in your own life and in my life and in lives of other people without being a teacher after that miracles then gifts of healing that means the gifts of healing they're not limited to the apostle after that and then they're not limited to the prophets after that and then they're not limited to the teachers after that and then gifts of healing helps helps somebody needs clothes to wear helps somebody needs accommodation helps somebody needs food help somebody needs upliftment and encouragement helps everything does not go to the apostle everything is not centered on the apostles after that we have health and governments that's administration put that chair there put that bench there write that letter to the stage and get this information out administration government and then the adversities of tongues and i pray the lord as he teaches us 
and we understand the truth, I pray we will live and walk by the truth in Jesus' name. Somebody must say amen. amen. The message today, the unity and usefulness of members in Christ. The unity and usefulness of members in Christ. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the uniqueness of born again members in Christ. Unique different from the world, different from their past, different from the sinners, unique, the uniqueness of born again members in Christ. Number two, the oneness of baptized, built up members in his church. When we're born again, you repent, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then you are baptized in water and then you are built into you are immersed you are integrated into the body of Christ built as a holy temple unto the Lord the foundation and the cornerstone being the Lord Jesus Christ the oneness of baptized, built up members in his church. Number three, the usefulness of body bearing members for the commission. Every member of the body, if you think about the body, every member of the body is supposed to be active, productive, and operational, functional, useful in the body. Whatever you are doing, think about that. If you're going to make progress in that assignment and in that work, you need the head, your brain. You need your eyes to see. You need your ears to hear instruction. You need your hands to move and to act. And you need your feet to carry you and move you to where you ought to be as you carry out the duty. Everyone useful in the kingdom. The usefulness of body bearing members for the commission. Let's look at number one. Number one, the uniqueness of born again members in Christ. Look at John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it tells us again, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter. It cannot be integrated. It cannot become part of the kingdom of God. The first essential experience is that you are born again. You are turned around. You become a new creature in Christ. You cannot be a man, a natural man, and then enter into the kingdom. You cannot be a natural man and be a member of Christ. If the natural man might be educated, education does not make you a member of the body of Christ. The natural man might be intelligent. Intelligence does not make you a member of the body of Christ. That natural man may be morally good. Morals alone, without being born again, will not make you a member of the body of Christ. Intelligent, you need to be born again. Educated, you need to be born again. And you are morally good, you still need to be born again. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is when you turn away from darkness, you come into the light, 
you turn away from your past life and you come to Christ if any man be in Christ is a new creature old things are passed away and behold all things are become new born again you become a unique born again member in Christ in James chapter 1 reading from verse 18 James chapter 1 verse 18 it tells us that we are begotten it says of his own will begat ye us by the word of truth by by the word of truth we hear the word of truth that's the word of salvation that's the gospel of salvation and that's the gospel that tells us that Christ and Christ alone is the Savior. We accepted that, we believe that, we confess that, and we came before the Lord, and then He wiped away all our past, and we are begotten of God by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Different distinct, unique, totally and completely only separated unto the Lord. And then he tells us in verse 21, he says in verse 21, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with, with meekness, not pride, and receive with meekness not attitude of I know it all I didn't come to hear the word of God I just came no when you come if you're a real child of God and you're begotten and you're born again and you have been taken out of the world and you come into the kingdom with meekness you receive the word which is able to save your souls receive the word which is able to save your souls. What's the uniqueness of a real member of the body of Christ? The uniqueness is, is born again. Not everybody in the world is born again. And so if you are born again, you are unique. Not only that, it be called out of the world, separated out of the world, and made different and distinct from the world. That's the uniqueness. Then you are a new creature in Christ. Old lifestyle is gone. A new lifestyle has come. And you can say by the grace of God, I used to be like this, but I'm no more like that. You're unique. You're different. The uniqueness of born again members in Christ. And now you have received the word of God engrafted in your soul, which is able to make you wise. Look at Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we're looking at verse 20. In Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 20, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You need, you know, the rest of the people, citizens of the world, they have their names registered in the world, or maybe they get their NIN. They have their name, their number, their picture captured for national utility. Or maybe you are in a company, they put your name in the register of the company. That's everybody. Everybody does that. But the uniqueness is that your name is not only in the register of this world, your name is written in the book of life in heaven. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. How do I know? If my name is written in heaven. Well, look at the world around you. Look at that thief. Look at that liar. Look at that deceiver. Look at that fighter. 
Look at that person that is taking everybody as enemy. Do you think their names are written in heaven? You say, I don't think so. The same thing with you. If you're just human, if you're carnal, if you're natural, if you're sinful, if you're transgressor, you know that your name is not there. It's the name of the people who have repented of their sins. They're born again and heaven recognizes them. And because heaven recognizes them, heaven registers them that the children of God and then the Spirit of God is bearing witness with your heart that you are a child of God and you rejoice. Angels are rejoicing already because you repented and the Father is joyful and, the, and Jesus Christ is happy and joyful and the saints of God are joyful and then in your heart the Holy Ghost registers that heaven rejoices Rejoices because of you and now you can rejoice because your name is written in heaven and then you now begin to walk and live as a child of God you just love to live right that's the uniqueness the people of the world they love to fight you love to do the things in the Word of God. That makes you different. That makes you unique. That makes you to be set apart from the people of the world. Look at First John chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That's unique. That's unique. If you take that away from the Christian experience, we're no more unique. If you say, well, I'm a member of the church, but there are some sins I cannot give up, you're not unique. And just like other people of the world, what makes them sinners? What makes them part of the world? Habits, character, behavior, action that you want to give up and so if you are not giving up anything and if you're just like them i like my bottle of alcohol i like my packet of cigarettes i like all my sin partners and i can't give up well not just like them you're not born again if you are born again whosoever is born of god does not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god i pray every one of us will have that experience in jesus name amen, amen. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. I pray this uniqueness of being born again, of being washed in the blood of the Lamb and being made white as white as snow and living in newness of life I pray by faith by prayer by surrender by total yieldedness unto the Lord this will become your Lord in Jesus name I said it will become your Lord in Jesus name Let's come to point number two now. Point number two is the oneness of baptized, built up members in his church. Look at that word, oneness. That doesn't mean they have the same function. The hand is united with the feet. Have you noticed when you are walking? As you are walking in, 
your hand also unconsciously is moving in line with the moving of your feet. Have you noticed while you are walking, your eyes are looking in the direction in which you are walking? Have you noticed all the time when you are moving that your ears are also hearing sound that will warn you, don't turn there, there is a car coming, don't turn there, you collide with another person. Have you noticed when you are walking, your breathing, your lungs are also functioning along with your walking? What we're saying is all the members of the body, they coordinate together, they cooperate together, and they're united together in whatever activity you may be doing. Now, when the hand does not cooperate with the head and the feet does not move in the direction that the head is pointing to, we say that person has a mental problem because the head cannot control the members of the body. The members of the body are, di are in discord. They're disunited. And because of that division and disunity, we say that entity, all of them, all of them together, the hands and the feet and the kidney and the heart and the breathing and the brain and the eyes, all of them put together as a person we we'll say he has mental problem. We we'll say he's lunatic. We we'll say he is insane. Now, if the members of the body of Christ, real members, born again, set apart, cleansed, washed, purified, if they are not united together, they make that body it's almost like blasphemy because that's what they do they make that body what Christ the head they make that insane you bring blasphemy into the body when members of the body are not one together the Lord wants us one I already explained to you that when you come to Christ, you are baptized in water. In Mark, reading from chapter 15, verse 16. Mark, chapter 15, verse 16. It tells us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then it says in verse 16, of chapter 16 and it says he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved you believe on the Lord as you believe on the Lord and your name is written in the book of life you are integrated into the body of Christ but then to totally identify with the Lord Jesus Christ you are immersed in water you are buried under the water you are baptized in water to show your burial with Christ and then you are brought up to show your resurrection raised up like Christ he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved he that believeth not even if he is baptized he that believeth not even if he is born in the church he that believeth not, even if he's paying tithes and offering. He that believeth not, even if he's dressing like one of us. He that believeth not shall be damned. The baptized members in his church. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 19, Now therefore, ye are no more strangers, if you have repented. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers, if you can point to the day, the time, the place, 
where you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and your life turned around. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers if you are known to heaven. If you're known to Christ, if your name is in the book of life in heaven, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers. If the Spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart, you are a child of God. If your behavior, if your action does not contradict your confession, now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of well, the saints and of the household of God. Look at verse 20. And I built upon the foundation. You are baptized. You are integrated into the body of Christ. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone and then in verse 21 it says in whom all the building fitly framed together if you have a pile of blocks maybe it's the right size maybe you pass through that block has passed through the machine at the right proportion of sand gravel and cement and now it's put aside. That's not a building yet. And there are people that are just like that block. And they're saying, I'm born again, I'm born again, I'm born again. They are not built together. They don't have the mind. They don't have the intention. They don't have the humility. They don't have the lowliness to allow another block to be on top of them, another block to be under them, another block to be on this side of them, another block to be on this side. There are lone rangers, and lone rangers will never make a building. The one that thinks of himself alone, thinks of his desires alone. All I want all I like, everything I want. I don't want that person to be by my side. I don't want that person to be on top of me. And they're always kicking and fighting. They are not built together with the body of Christ. It says in verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into unto an holy temple in the Lord. And then in verse 22, look at what he tells us, in whom ye also are built together. If you are not a stone, a block that is just put aside, beautiful, nice, well constructed, but you are just in isolation. If you are brought in, if you yield yourself and yield your mind and yield your thoughts and yield your character and you are mellow and you are matured, you are part of the body of Christ, built together in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God, for an habitation of God. Think about that. A pile of stones, a heap of sand gravel a heap of blocks there nobody will go and live there but it's when those blocks and the cement and the gravel when they're all brought together and built up into a habitation that god will dwell and live in us but a scattered church a divided church one part there, one part there. They never think alike. They never agree purposefully. And they never have one mind, one faith, one doctrine. Christ will not live there. But in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It emphasizes our oneness. And it's when we are one. 
the Lord will do wonders among us in Jesus' name. And hey, look at hey, look at John chapter 17, verse 11. John chapter 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. Christ going to heaven. But these are in the world. And I come to the Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, that they may be one. Keep them, that they may be one. Secure them that they may be one. Strengthen them that they may be one. Keep them holy and keep them righteous that they may be one as we are. You can begin to check up in your own heart. You say you're a member of the church, his church. Are you one with the rest of us as the Father and the Son are one? Or do you have your own peculiar way, your own peculiar character, your own peculiar disposition, your own peculiar likes, and what you don't like? Are you always wanting, you know? I want it like this, I want it like this. If it is not like that, we'll have to see what to do so that everybody will bow to me, bend to me. But he keeps us, keeps us from Satan. He keeps us from sin. He keeps us from sickness. He keeps us from all the evil of the world that they may be one as we. As we are one look at verse 14 there in verse 14 it says I've given them thy word the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world verse 17 sanctify them through thy truth thy word is true verse 20 in verse 20 it says neither pray i for these alone these 12 these initial disciples neither pray i for these alone but for them also you remember the prayer is talking about sanctify them through thy truth that's the prayer that word is truth Neither am I praying for these first century disciples alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. And why is he praying that prayer for them and for us? Verse 21, that they all may be one. That they all may be one. That they all may be one. If you come to church, and then uh, we we'll sit down together, we we'll hear the same word together, we we'll pray to the same Father together, we we'll have Jesus as the same Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer, Coming King together, we we'll have the same Bible together, we're we'll going to the same heaven together, but you are never one. You cannot see eye to eye with the preacher, with the pastor, with the ministers, there is something, an idol in your heart. And you must worship that idol, bend to that idol. And no matter what you enjoy from the body of Christ, your idol is number one in your heart. And you cannot serve God and mammon. And because of that, your idol keeps you away from being one of the church. If you are not one of the people of God here, when you cross over to the other side, 
you will not stay with them live with them dwell with them forever it takes salvation and it takes the answer to the prayer of jesus that he takes that ego that pride that divisive spirit and that carnality away from your life and then you become an answer to the prayer of jesus that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee i in him and he in me I in you and you in me. If you are in me, you'll be thinking the way I think. You'll be going the direction I'm going. You will support the passion of my heart. If I am not only with you, but in you, we will be planning together, strategizing together, and moving together. And the idol in your heart and the idol in my heart would have been totally burnt up, eradicated. It is that idol, the idol of self, that hinders this unity. But the prayer of Jesus, and you know, if you prove Jesus wrong, I see going to be in good condition and terms with you. He prayed for the oneness of the body. And in this local body, in this same deeper life, the same doctrine, the same Father humanly, Father in the Lord, and the same direction, the same program, and yet if the heart cannot be together there is something missing in our christian experience that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also believers that they also saved and sanctified that they also in answer to my prayer that they also may be one in us not one outside us father and son god and the lord jesus christ not any of us going out and borrowing the philosophy of the world and the program of the world not that but all of us we are in christ and we believe the same word and the same doctrine and it says that the world may believe that thou hast sent me look at verse 22 in verse 22 and the glory which thou givest me i have given them the glory the power the splendor, the beauty, the heavenliness that you have given me the head. I give them. Why? That they may be one. Not to show up, not to brag, not to say, look how beautiful, how powerful I am. Look at how splendid I am, how exalted I am. I give them the same glory that you have given me for one purpose and one purpose only, that they may be one as we are one. We divest ourselves, we empty ourselves of the glory of heaven when we are not one. We're coming into the kingdom. We're coming and we're integrated into the body of Christ. And then as soon as we're coming, we forget the reason why we're in. We forget that the reason why we're in and where grace has been given to us, where special, why special blessings have been given to us, why the glory of Christ is imparted on us, that the reason and the purpose from heaven is that we may be one, even as the Father and the Son are one. Verse 23, it tells us, it says, I in them. Hold on. If Christ is in me, and Christ is in you, how come 
we cannot see eye to eye? How come we cannot walk the same direction? If the same Christ inside you, controlling you, is the same Christ inside me, controlling me, how is it we cannot understand each other's language? How is it we're not united? How is it you're going this way and I'm going this other way? How is it we're not hearing his voice? I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. That they may be made perfect in one. If we're not united, we'll never be perfect. No matter what experience you claim, you are saved, we're watching. Sanctified, we're watching. You go to pray and you pray and fast for days, we're watching. You're holding on to the promises of God, we're watching. You're getting ready for the coming of the Lord, we're watching. If all that experience you claim, saved, sanctified, knowledgeable, baptized in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, seeing vision, whatever. You can pray for hours, you can fast for days. If you are not one for the body, for the people of God, there's no way you'll ever be perfect. Fasting without perfection. Praying without perfection. Giving tithes and offering without perfection. Running up and down without perfection. And then Christ comes. And the very one thing is looking for, that oneness, that perfection, is not there. You have labored in vain. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me, as loved them. As thou hast loved me, that the reason he wants us to a real member of Christ, he wants us to be one, to be united. Stop thinking about your own ideology and your own likes and dislikes and think about what Christ has brought so that with united vision and united force and united skill and united power, we can reach the world and make the world to know that Christ has come for them. Point number three here, the unselfishness of body bearing members for the commission. The unselfishness, unselfishness, unselfishness of body bearing members for the commission. If we're going to see the world evangelized if we're going to see people brought out of their darkness out of their evil out of their imprisonment out of their captivity out of their confinement if we're going to see the gospel flowing out reaching out if we're going to see the world penetrating into millions and millions of hearts Number one, you must become unselfish. Unselfish. Not only me and my house, not only me and my relatives, not only me and our local church, not only me and our headquarters church, we must become unselfish and the same heart and the same mind that Christ had for the rest of the world, for the whole world, we must have the might of Christ in us and bear the burden, the burden of our weary world, wanting everyone to hear the gospel. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill 
the law of Christ, bear, carry, lift up the bodies of other people so that we fulfill the law of Christ. When we think of problems, maybe everybody want, everybody perhaps one way or the other has problem. But look at what God has done for you. Look at the goodness of God, the grace of God, the, 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 the possibilities in your life. Although there are little, little things that, you know, the broom of the Holy Spirit will still sweep off, but look at the great things the Lord has done for you. And then other people, if you're still saying, until all problems are solved, I'm going to, I'm not going to take part, that's selfish. Until this is cleared and that is cleared, I'm not going to take part, that's selfish. Until they look at our area and they give me this and they give me this and you know money is available, they have money for crusade, they must have money for me, I'm not having something to eat. Until that is done, I'm not going to, you know, unite with the people of God, you'll be waiting too long. The Lord is saying, be, bear ye the body, one another's body, and in that way fulfill the law of Christ. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 49. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 49. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not us. You remember John? John is that disciple whom Jesus loved. John is that disciple who would lean his head upon the bosom of Jesus and he wanted to monopolize the love of Christ. He wanted to monopolize the virtue coming from Christ. John, the selfish. Maybe you are like that. You have a privileged position in the church and then you see other people and they might get to the position Christ will allow them to lean upon his bosom say what are you doing there who brought you there don't you know that that special position belongs to so and so we saw one casting out devils in thy name and we forbade him and because he followeth not us look at verse 50 verse 50 tells us and jesus said unto him forbid him not john you know what you are not of the same mind with christ christ does not want you to shield out anyone to block out anyone and you are busy going about don't do that don't do that don't do that and jesus said forbid him not for he that is not against us is for us look at numbers chapter 11 numbers chapter 11 reading from verse 27 and there ran a young man and told moses and said elder and medad do prophesy in the camp he had his own share, he prophesied. Caleb had his own share, he prophesied. Sixty-eight of them had their own share, and they prophesied. But Eldad and Medad were in the camp, and the Lord also gave them the same gift. Joshua, what are you thinking about? Are you more zealous than God? Are you more passionate than God? Do you know who to do that, who not to do that more than God? The God of heaven gave them the same gift, these two people, as he gave to the 68. And then this Joshua ran, a young man, and he told Moses and said, Elder than me, that do prophesy in the camp. Verse 28, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of the young men, answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. Selfishness, selfishness. 
were it not that Joshua took correction and he allowed that selfishness to be extracted, to be uprooted, to be cleansed off, to be burnt off from his heart and his life, he would never have become the leader he became. He said, they said, this is a servant of Moses. And he said, my Lord, Moses, forbid them. But well, thank God for a leader like Moses. There are some leaders, they only listen to what their selfish subordinates tell them. Sir, look at these two people. Yes, we know they are doing good, but did you give them instruction? Look at these two people. They are sending forth the message. They are even more active than we are. Did you give them authority? And they speak because of their selfishness. Thank God for Moses. I say thank God for Moses. And I pray we'll thank God for you. Amen. Ah, you said amen. When I said thank God for when I said thank God for Moses, you said amen. And now when I say thank God for you, then you said amen. I'm going to start that again. Thank God for Moses. Yeah. And now I thank God for you. Yeah. You know, people, if you come to tell the pastor, sir, me that, elder, they're doing this, they're doing this, and the pastor says, leave them alone. We're all working for God. They come another time. They have not learned from that first lesson. They need to go to God, extract that selfishness from their heart, that depravity, that carnality from their heart. They come again, sir. So and so, so and so. They're doing this, they're doing this. They do permit them, leave them alone. Okay, okay. We'll never come and tell him anything. All the time, leave them alone. All the time, leave them alone. Now, let's all pray that in my heart there'll be no carnality. In your heart, there'll be no carnality. In our sisters, there'll be no carnality. In our young people and youths, there'll be no carnality. In our children, there'll be no carnality. And when we have the nature of Christ, the love of Christ, and then the passion of Christ, all moving us on without any selfishness, we will take this nation for Christ in Jesus' name. Look at Moses, and Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake, envious thou for my sake, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord will put his spirit upon them, upon you, Amen. upon them, Amen. upon our sisters, Amen. upon our brothers, Amen. upon everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. My brother, district pastor there, I grew pastor there, if you heard somebody got sick and instead of coming to you they went to the next door brother the next door sister because of the urgency and then the brother didn't you want to ask them did you tell the district pastor did you tell group pastor and he just dressed up and he got there and then he prayed and a miracle happened and they will come on Thursday and uh, this person said you are looking at me here I would have been dead since Wednesday but I called brother so and so didn't mention the name of the pastor and the name of the group pastor and the name of the general superintendent he said I called brother so and so and I'm telling you the moment he came and mentioned the name of Jesus I was healed and I even felt stronger than I ever was what do you do to that testimony maybe you come to the pulpit and say now everybody pay attention know how you give testimony we're not here to exalt any man we're not here to exalt any woman i hear you sir 
if they had mentioned your name and showed you of the Elijah of today and they said I called the group pastor I called the pastor this a pastor and when he came he, he just mentioned the name of Jesus it was like the GS praying short and straightforward and then everything went away I'm alive today you will come there and say everybody did you hear that testimony praise the Lord God is at work I said God it has worked and it's just seeing everybody even my little self here you are running to this you are running to that but should I want to tell you that God's power is here I love that say the same thing when the miracle happens through somebody that we don't know so that there'll be no selfishness there'll be no carnality there'll be no ego we'll all join hands together and we'll move together and the power of God will never stop in our church in Jesus name those good old days are coming back again in your life they're coming back in your family they're coming back in our districts they're coming back and I've been telling you before that I pass the power on to you. Today is different. You will be on fire. Yeah. I can't see the people on fire. Where are you? You will be on fire in Jesus' name. Open your mouth, open your mouth, and let God speak to you today while you are praying. Let the fire fall, let the fire fall, and let the power from heaven fall upon every thirsty soul. And tell the Lord, I'll be one, I'll be united with the people of God, I'll be one, I'll be united. All the carnality and all the depravity and all those things you know that have been making me only myself, my little self, and you have an idol all there that you are protecting tell the Lord that all that idol the Lord will take away from your heart and you will have you will have a genuine sanctification and genuine oneness and genuine unity with the people of God in Jesus name tell him tell him tell him tell him open your heart open your life examine yourself have you been selfish Examine yourself. Have you been thinking of yourself? Examine yourself. Are you full of self? Are you full of self? Are you full of carnality? Are you full of depravity? You tell the Lord, O oh Lord, walk in my heart. Walk in my soul. Walk in my spirit. Take all this away and take all this selfishness and division and disunity take all that away away from my heart are you sure you are born again your sins are forgiven the spirit of god bears witness with your heart you're a real child of God. It's your name in the book of life in heaven. The change, the transformation, the life of the new creature as that be worked out, operational, functional in your life. born again are you born again if the engrafted word in your heart are you receiving the word of God with meekness and loneliness or is there pride there pride has come in and pride stands at the door of your heart I will not allow the word to penetrate Receive the word with meekness. Have a unique Christian life. Spotless Christian life. Live the life of the kingdom. Kingdom life. Kingdom behavior. 
kingdom righteousness kingdom love kingdom yieldedness are you integrated into the body of Christ built up are you an isolated block no ranger all you see is yourself all you know is your need are you full of yourself Are you fully surrendered unto the Lord? No idol, no pride, no ego. No toy that you are playing with as a baby, and in that you. From having the vision of the regions beyond. Always angry at nothing. Angry at what makes Christ happy. You have the same mind with Christ. The same love as Christ, the same devotion as Christ, the same pursuit as Christ, he prayed for our sanctification. While there's selfishness there, Sanctification has not yet taken place. When there is carnality there, self-defense, self-promotion, sanctification has not entered in. What a self-centeredness there, self-consideration there, Sanctification has not entered in. Where me, 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 I, my territory, my terrain, my dominion, my assignment, my privilege, my position, my place, where that is, Sanctification has not entered in. Bring that self to the altar. Have it crucified. Present the old man, the old nature unto Christ. Let that thing be crucified. And the body of sin destroyed. Then will you profess sanctification. Then will self, selfishness quit the throne of your heart. Then will you be one. For the rest of the church, as the Father and the Son are one, and then will you give a chance for the gospel to reach the world that the world may believe?
that the Father art in me and I in thee and that they may all be one in us. Don't just come to church. Let everything we're hearing penetrate your heart. And pray that from this day, your life will be different. Your attitude will be different. Your disposition will be different. You become really unique, an instrument of unity for the church of the living God. And let the unity begin at home. Charity begins at home. Unity begins at home. Love begins at home. Let the children see father and mother are one as God and Christ are one. The children and the parents are one. As God the Father and God the Son are one. The members of the church are one. Well, the ministers, as God and Christ are one. Assurance that your name is in the book of life in heaven. And you live as one having the heavenly recognition. And then pray that as we are one, sanctified, purified, and that make nature taken away, that the fire, the power of the Holy Ghost will be upon your life. Fire, power, fervency, strength from on high will be in your life and Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost will fill you saturate you empower you envelope you and then there will be great possibilities of the Spirit in your life as you are one united for the body of Christ.